والصلاه والسلام على رسول الكريم We do live in an atheistic world. It is a world in which uh, atheism, secularism, agnosticism is very popular. And in fact, the, I was going to say that in fact, atheism and related concepts are becoming so popular that they threaten to overtake the Muslim world if it hasn't already done so. Not too long ago, the poet Iqbal wrote that the Qibla of the world is Mecca, but the Qibla of Mecca is the United States of America. And in the United States of America, they say in God we trust, but we know for a fact that that is a farce. Everyone knows that it is in the almighty dollar that people really put their trust. So, materialism the idea that there is no God, or even if there is a God, we shouldn't worry about him because he doesn't really matter, is uh, overtaking the entire world. Uh, people talk about globalism. They're making the entire world a singular entity. And they want the belief of the entire populace to be similar prevailing belief in the United States of America. And that prevailing belief is materialism. You shouldn't think that God exists, or even if you think that maybe God exists, you should live your life as if he does not exist. Because either he doesn't exist, or he doesn't matter. So I want to explore these concepts, where do they come from, and whether in fact we can have a viable way of life without God in the picture. You must realize that in the Enlightenment period of Europe, people looked at Christianity and they said, we can no, be we can no longer believe in this religion. Three gods and one god are two different concepts, and to meld the two together doesn't really work in anyone's minds. They looked at the Bible and they saw that the Bible was written by human beings a long time ago and some of what the Bible says cannot be believed in today. So on the whole they decided to leave off religion. They looked at the church as a whole and they saw that the church was responsible for some of the most brutal murders in history. And they said that if this is what institutionalized religion does, then we should have no part of it. So in the modern world, people are reacting to some uh, aspects of Christian history. In the Enlightenment period, there was the rapid advancement of science. People were finally broken loose from the constraints of the religion in which they grew up. With the advent of Darwinism and other advances of science, people came to the idea eventually that God does not really communicate with human beings but there is a God <coughs> but that that God must have created the world and left it to run on its own just like when somebody winds up a clock and then leaves it to run it tells the time on its own they figure that God must have done something like this that idea was called deism it's spelled with a D but that is not so far removed from atheism, the idea that God does not exist. Because if you can come that far to say that, well, God created the world and left it to run, by implication we should live our lives as if God does not exist. Because we just are now in control. God has nothing to do with the running of the world. And so people took the next step to ask, well, does God really exist in the first place? They describe God as an absentee landlord, or so it would appear. You know, like you're renting your property from somebody, or you're renting the place where you live from somebody, and he doesn't come to claim the rent. So after a while you wonder, <laughs> does he really exist? Is there any such person? Because he hasn't come to claim the rent for a while. So that was the next step in Europe, atheism. To think that, well, God must be like that absent, absentee landlord who apparently will never come to claim the rent. 
So we carry on as though he does not exist. And then they started to ask some probing questions. Well, if we heard that God is all loving, and we heard that God is all powerful, and that he knows everything, well then, if there is evil in the world, God would know it. And if God is powerful enough, then he is able to remove that evil. And if he's so loving, as we used to hear, then he would want to remove all of that evil and suffering. So as a result, there will be no evil and suffering in the world. But the fact is that there is evil and suffering in the world. So that could only mean that God does not exist. And so the thinking went further and further. So in the modern world, this is the idea that is now prevalent. The idea that God does not exist. Some think that God may exist, or may not exist, but we do not have enough knowledge to be able to decipher that question. To know whether God exists, or to know whether he does not exist. So we should just conclude that we just do not know. So th there is a word that describes these people. If theism is the belief in God, and atheism is the belief that God does not exist, what do you call a person who does not know whether God exists or does not exist. What? Agnostic, yeah? An agnostic is such a person. And the concept itself is called agnosticism. Now in the modern world, people don't want to even contemplate the question. This is so far removed from their minds to even wonder whether God exists or not. They just haven't bothered with the question. They carry on as if they are in full control and only what we see is what we get. This is materialism. Only the material world exists. There is no soul, there is no God, there is no life hereafter. A related concept is secularism. I want to explain what is the background of secularism. In Judaism, there is the idea that God rules. God gave them a set of laws, commandments, regulations, and Musa a.s. was the judge of the people. So any dispute would be brought to him, he would judge them according to the law of Allah. These laws, or some of them, are still in the Torah. For example, there is a judgment against sodomy. Somebody commits homosexuality, he should be stoned to death. So if such a case was brought to Musa a.s., this is his judgment against them according to the Torah, the Old Testament. And they have a lot of detailed laws for various aspects of human activity. Now the same concept would have continued in Christianity as well. Christians even to this day pray for the kingdom of God to come upon earth without even understanding what exactly they are asking for. But it really means to bring the rule of God upon earth. And if the rule of God comes, then that is going to be implemented according to the same laws which they have in the Old Testament. But the Catholic Church maintained some aspect of governing by the rule of God. The Pope is said to be infallible. He is guided by God when he makes pronouncements on behalf of God. So there might be other things in which he is not guided, but when he is teaching the religion, they say he is guided by God. So you have here a theocracy. God ruling through the Pope. But remember we talked about uh, the evils that were practiced by the church itself. People looked at the horrors of the crusades. And they said that if this is what the rule of God does, then it's not suitable for us. So they turned away from the rule of God and they set up uh, a dichotomy between church and state. They said that the church should not interfere in the running of the state. The state should operate as a secular enterprise, not a religious enterprise. Religion should have nothing to do with the way in which you govern your state. So the United States of America, Canada, many of the industrialized countries of the modern world are operating under this very principle, secularism. Somebody comes to you and says, well, hey, wait a minute, how come you guys can preach Islam here, but we cannot preach Christianity in Saudi Arabia? Well, there's a difference. 
Saudi Arabia, with all its failings, is trying to rule according to the law of Allah. Maybe not trying hard enough, but you know there is a uh, there is a flavor there of Islam. Whereas in Canada, secularism rules. It should have nothing to do with religion, and a, the the governing powers should not favor any particular religion. So every religion should have an equal access and an equal opportunity to preach. Even non-religion should have an opportunity to be preached. Satanism can be preached just as much as Islam can be preached in this part of the world. So if somebody worships Satan, if they have a little cult in which they uh, perform sacrifices to Satan, that should be allowed also to be preached unless other laws come into play to pro prohibit child sacrifice for example or to prevent cruelty to animals and so on but so long as they are just making dua according to the laws of the land your dua is no better than the Satan is making dua to Satan so everything goes so homosexuals can have their gay pride day just as you can have your uh, eight prayers on a particular day. This is the Eid for them. And the most you can say to them is that pride is still a sin. You can't say that the other thing is wrong. So everything has an equal access. Secularism then is what rules. So I want you to understand then that the roots of secularism is atheism. And so you should be equipped to answer the questions that come from the atheistic direction. You should be able to answer questions as to why do we first of all believe in God? You know Islam to be true. But you will be asked certain questions which you need to know the answers for. So let's uh, start at the beginning then. Are there any good reasons for believing that God exists? Forget for a moment that you're a Muslim and just think about the question as a reasonable person. I would say yes, there are some good reasons for believing that God does exist. My first reason is what uh, philosophers call the cosmological argument. Now that's a big word, but uh, let's think of why it's called that. We live in a universe, and the universe is called a cosmos. It is not called a chaos. It is called a cosmos, which means the opposite of chaos. It is an organized system not a chaotic throwing together of bits and parts. So that organization in the universe itself speaks of an organizer. But more than this, we know that from nothing, nothing comes. But we do have something existing. So where did all this come from? It must have come from somewhere. And you cannot say that nothing exists, that everything is an illusion. Some people have taken that uh, uh, tack. They said, no, nothing really exists. It's only an illusion. Even what you think you see doesn't really exist. It only appears so. Unfortunately, one of our Muslim writers in recent times uh, also started to propound this idea that nothing, in fact, really exists. Everything you see is only your impression of what is there your impression that something is there. But even if you try to doubt everything, the philosopher Descartes tried to apply this test to doubt that anything exists. And then he started to doubt that his own body exists. Because again, what he sees to be his body might be his own mental experience that he has a body. And that mental experience may not be true. That might be his own delusion, self-delusion, that he has a body. But then he finally concluded that he couldn't doubt that he has a mind. Because the moment he starts to doubt that he has a mind, he's actually using his mind. So at least he has a mind. <laughs> and then he came up with the famous words, Kojito erge so. I think, therefore I am. So at least something exists. And we can still ask this age-old question, if something exists, where did this something come from? 
it couldn't have just simply come from nowhere. It must have been brought into existence. Let's look at it a, a little bit more in detail. Every physical state, and we're answering now to the whole question of materialism, we're showing that there is something more than just simply the material world. Every state of physical existence owes itself to another state of physical existence which came before it and which is the cause of it. Right? The whole scientific enterprise, according to Albert Einstein, is permeated with the sense of causation. So now, Shukran. So now, one physical state of existence is caused by another one that came before it. And that one is also caused by another state that came before it. True? And that's a state of existence also caused by one that came before it. But then, we cannot go back forever. We must be able to find the first in the series. In other words, we must eventually come to some state which is the first in the whole series. If, if we can get to the first in the whole series, then we could have never gotten from there to here. But we are here. So that means there is a finite or a limited number of physical states. You understand this point? Suppose there is an, an unlimited number and we count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Can we finish counting? No. So, if there is an unlimited number and we start from where we are and we count backwards to where we came from, can we finish counting? No. Suppose we start from where we came from and we count to where we are now. Can we finish counting? No. That means we'll never get here. But the fact is that we are here. So that the number of physical states then could not be infinite. It has to be a finite number. So they are countable. So there's we can count from here to there. We can get to the first one. But then, if we get to the first one, by definition, this should also have owed its exist its existence to another state which came before it. Right? But then how could it be the first one? Except if what came before it is not a physical state. Something else that brought that physical state into existence without being itself a physical state. I hope this is not too complex for you. Let, let me put it in a simpler uh, <laughs> fashion. Suppose you have a, a row of dominoes, one knocking the other one down, one knocking the other one down. So anywhere you look at that whole string, you see that uh, you know dominoes are falling. And why are they falling? Because one knocks the other down, which knocks the other down, which knocks the other down, which knocks the other down. So the whole series is falling. True? Now, there has to be a first one in the whole series. One that knocked the other one down and then that knocked the other one down and so on and so on and so on and so forth. If there was no first one in the series to knock another one down, then the, the, the whole operation would not begin. True? So anywhere we look at that whole string, we look at dominoes falling, we know that there is a first one. Otherwise, <laughs> the things couldn't fall. Right? Now, the first one, however, by definition is the first one, so there's no domino that knocked that one down. <laughs> so how did that one fall? Yeah, something that is not a domino must have knocked that one down. Right? You can imagine a person, you know, just tipping that first one, and then the whole series falls. So then, the moment we start to think about the universe in which we exist, we realize that the universe must have had someone to bring it into existence. And that someone, or whatever it is, so far we haven't discovered much about who that is, right? From our argument so far. Whoever or whatever that is, it is not a physical state of existence. Because we've already dealt with that. We said every physical state of existence owes itself to one that preceded it and is the cause of it. And we go back now to the first one. But the first state of physical existence could not be the cause of itself and it could not also have been caused by another physical state. So whatever caused it, it's not itself a physical state. Just like whatever tipped that first domino is not itself a domino. 
So more than just the material world exists, there is something that brought the material world into existence and that is not a material or physical uh, state of existence. Well, we know more about that. Just as you can imagine that uh, someone, you know, tipping that down, you know, it is our common experience on the whole that when we see things organized or designed, we automatically conclude that there is an organizer or a designer. If you came into the masjid today and you, you know, you found a, a, a piece of paper, it's got some handwriting on it, you, you know that somebody has been here before you and they have written something on that paper. You won't, uh, you know, make up a very strange explanation of how this paper came into being and, you know, how the writing, you know, so by chance started to appear on that paper. Your natural explanation is that there is some intelligent person who wrote something meaningful on that piece of paper. So in a similar sense, whenever we see things designed, we posit that there is a designer, there is an organizer, there is a fashioner. Now some of these arguments may seem commonplace to you, you know this already, but the more we think about it, the more equipped you are to deal with these things, and the more confident you are, because it is so uh, uh, prevalent in your conscious uh, mind. So you should be aware of these things and be ready when people come to you with questions. Then you're, you're, you're quite confident and capable of answering. So then, let's think about it more. We know also that when something appears to be designed, it existed already in the mind of some designer or architect or engineer before it became a physical reality. If you think about your watch, for example, you know, somebody already conceived of that before it became a product to be available in your retail stores. So then somebody starts to draw up the blueprint and then it goes to manufacturing and finally you have the product. But it existed already in the mind of somebody. You know, somebody already worked that out and then it became a physical reality. So if that is our common reality then, what stops us from using the same experience and understanding we have and apply that to the universe in which we exist. The universe appears to be designed. We should then conclude that this universe must have existed in the mind of some designer before it became a physical reality. But then you need to have a designer. There must be a designer who has a mind. So not only did we discover that there must be a non-physical reality that brought the universe into existence, but now we are discovering that that physical reality has an intelligent mind. Now the answer to this whole problem about design is that things only appear to be designed, but that everything are just products of a long series of evolutionary change. And that while they appear to be designed, they're not really designed. They just uh, happen to survive because they are fit for survival. And the more fit they are for survival, the better they are at surviving, and they do survive. So once they survive, they're surviving because they do have this complexity about them. Now I know that sounds a, a little bit uh, of a mouthful. Let, let me break that down into a, a simpler explanation. Let, let's say you have one little matchstick, and it's just you know sitting there, and you put another little matchstick beside it. And then you put a third little matchstick to form, you know, a U. And then you put a fourth one, now you have a square. And then you put one more little matchstick there and you put some glue on all of them together. You have one standing upright. Eventually you can build a house out of that, right? With one little matchstick at a time, you can build a nice little uh, structure. But once you have that structure, it appears as though it is designed. And we know it has been designed just by our thought experiment here. But now if you take the designer out of the picture and imagine that by some process this could have just come together by chance, then of course it will have the same appearance as though it was designed, although it only came together by chance. Now biologists think that they have worked out the whole complex uh, theory called evolution by which they can explain the presence of the appearance of design. We appear to be designed, but we're not really designed. We're just products of blind evolutionary chance, they say. There's no creator. But the explanations which they have can only go so far. 
and not all of design that we find can be explained by evolution alone. Because evolution by itself starts with the understanding of certain basic designs already. For example, certain things which are called natural laws. Evolution works already with the assumption that there are natural laws which will produce the results of evolution. So the natural laws themselves, if they are to be called laws at all, are not explained by evolution but assumed by evolution. So since you start with this assumption that there are certain natural laws by which everything is operating and changing and evolving, then you already commit yourself to the fact that there is a creator of those natural laws. So then there is no proper answer from the side of uh, biology or evolution science or any other science for this whole problem of design. And so we have two arguments so far. One, for the existence of the universe together, there has to be a non-material being. And second, for the design in the universe, there has to be a designer, a creator, a fashioner. Alright, I'll go to a third argument. We have a sense of right and wrong. And that sense has to be explained. Where does this come from? If we are products of blind evolutionary chance, then we are what we are because we are fit for survival. And we have the characteristics that made us more fit for survival. So tigers have sharp claws because that will help them in survival. Animals, certain animals have uh, very long and vicious canines because that makes them fit for survival. So by a similar analogy, whatever we have, we have it because that makes us more fit for survival. But then, we should have the traits which would make us fit for survival, like aggressiveness, ferociousness, and so on. But in fact, that's not what we have. We have some opposite traits to that. We have uh, things like altruism. Altruism is the sense of doing good just for the sake of doing good. Forget for a moment that you're a Muslim. Okay, suppose you're no longer a Muslim, but that stop you from doing good? Now, certain things which you uh, feel so ingrained in you that you would do them anyway. Certain things which are good. Now, of course, you might have a, a problem defining altogether what's good for everyone as a whole. But you know what's good for yourself. You have some idea of certain things which are good. <coughs> so we see some people, either within religion or outside religion, sacrificing themselves in order to help others. But if the theory of evolution would explain everything about us, then a human being should not sacrifice himself in order to help somebody else. He should sacrifice the other person in order to help himself. Because survival of the fittest is what rules. And since we are surviving because we are fit, then we should have these characteristics which would make us even more fit in the future. So we will kill off others in order to survive, but not help others by sacrificing ourselves. So where does something like altruism come from then? The best explanation for this is that it comes from God who is the source of goodness and He has already imbued us with that. So we are moral beings, and the creator of the heavens and the earth is also a moral being. All right, fourth argument. Let's summarize what we have so far before we go to the fourth. From the first argument, we realize that there must be a powerful being who is not a physical being or part of the physical universe that created the universe, brought it into existence. Second, that powerful being must have a mind. Because the universe must have existed in the mind of some creator, fashioner, designer before it came into existence. Third, we are now seeing that whoever that is must be a moral being. One who has imbued human beings with goodness. Now, of course, argument. Without going into details, you already are familiar with many reasons for believing the Quran to be the word of Allah. Just looking at it from a reasonable perspective. 
to see where this book has come from in history, when was it first available, asking questions like who could have written this book, whether the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him could have written this book, whether he could have learned it from other people in his environment, or whether this really is a revelation from the Almighty God. What do we conclude from such a reasonable discussion? We conclude that the Quran is the word of Allah. True? Okay. Now if we follow that conclusion then, then we have one more to add to our series of arguments that God exists. Because if the Quran is the word of Allah, then Allah exists. Right? Not only that, but secularism now fails as an explanation for our existence or how we should govern our lives because the idea of secularism is that we carry on as though God does not exist. He has nothing to do with the running of the world. He has just left it up to us to do what we want. Now, if the Quran really is the word of Allah, then He hasn't just simply left it up to do, for us to do what we want. He has given us a law by which to live. So we have four arguments so far. Okay, I'll press forward to a fifth one, which is not really an argument to prove that God exists. But let me follow it nevertheless, and I'll tell you where I leave with this. Now if I ask you, does Allah exist? You say yes. When you're praying, you know that there is an entity to which you're praying. If you make Hajj, you feel the experience of Allah being alive and, and being present in the universe, and you feel that you have a very close and intimate connection with Allah. Some people feel the same when they make their salat as well. Right? You go into sujood and you feel that closeness with Allah Azza wa Jalla. Now you have no doubt that Allah exists. Now, if that is your experience that Allah exists, that doesn't prove that He exists, because some other people might have some other experience about the God that they worship, right? But now, if somebody comes to you and tells you that Allah does not exist, they should give you some good reasons for believing that Allah does not exist. But in fact, they do not have any good reason for believing that Allah does not exist. An atheist cannot prove that Allah does not exist. So now, you have all of these good arguments from one to four, to show that Allah does exist. Plus now five, it is your experience that Allah exists, so that your experience confirms the reasons which you have already looked at. But the atheist friend comes to you and says, Ah, you shouldn't believe in Allah. She so asks him why? And he has no reason. So since you already know that Allah exists, and you have good reasons for believing that He exists, why should you change that belief for no reason at all? The atheist has no reason, but he expects you to give up that belief. Now, the best argument that atheists are able to muster against this impressive lineup of arguments for the existence of God is one which I already mentioned previously at the start of my talk. They say, look, this world is a cruel place. And if God really existed, there wouldn't be such cruelty in the world. Because God is all-loving, He is all-knowing, and he's all powerful. If he knows everything, he knows what we're experiencing. And if he's powerful, he has the ability to remove the suffering. And if he's loving, he would want to do it. So the presence of suffering in the world proves that God does not exist. But actually there's a fallacy in that line of reasoning. There's a logical fallacy. Because in fact the conclusion that God does not exist does not follow from what the premises hold. Remember, the premises or the assumptions are one, that God is all-powerful, two, that God is all-knowing, three, that God is all-loving. And then from that, from that we conclude that God does not exist. The conclusion just doesn't follow. Because God might be all-loving, He might not be all-loving, He might not be all-loving, so suffering in the world does not prove that God does not exist. Again, because He might have good reasons for allowing suffering in the world. Now we know that Allah has some good reasons. And we don't know all of His reasons. But some of His reasons are, for example, that suffering might be given as a test on the individual who is suffering. Second, that it might be a test for other individuals to see how they respond to somebody in their midst suffering. Third, it might be a punishment for sins of the individual. So that by the suffering here in this life, he is relieved from suffering in the life hereafter. 
So what appears to be a suffering now would actually turn out to be to his ultimate benefit. Because anyone given the choice between the two should really choose the suffering in this world as opposed to the suffering in the life hereafter. Fourth, it might be in compensation for something which is good for this person. Allah gives some difficulty here, but when he shows up on the life, uh, in the life hereafter, he forgets all his suffering when he is dipped into the paradise once. So as in, in exchange for some suffering here, he is given infinite good in the life hereafter, so that ultimately it turns out to be for his good in the long run. Although it appears that he suffered a little here, but it is beneficial for him in the long run. And we can go on and on. Fifth, suffering might be allowed in this world because human beings have been given the choice to do right and to do wrong. So Allah naturally provides the world with things which should be beneficial and will be useful. But some of these things will be used for harmful purposes. Like a knife is useful for cutting a fruit to feed a hungry person. But the same knife can be used by somebody to cut the stomach of an innocent person. All right? So human beings, by give, being given free choice, might be inflicting harm upon other human beings. Six, human beings, by committing sins, might be bringing down certain consequences that we don't foresee and that are not uh, visible in the sequence of events but only in the final stage. For example, human beings commit adultery or they commit sodomy, homosexuality and then they get as a result of that diseases like AIDS. And then they wonder, well, where did this come from? And they seek some natural explanations and they wonder, God, why do you allow such suffering in the world? But this suffering might have been as a result of human actions themselves which have a consequence. Somebody touches a stove and his hand gets burned. So you can't ask, oh God, why did you allow my hand to be burnt? He should ask, why did he touch the stove in the first place? So certain actions which people perform might be bringing about these uh, results. And in that case, there are good reasons why God is allowing this. Seven. If God just simply allowed people to do what they want and not to suffer any consequences, how many people would really have a close and intimate relationship with God? Many would turn away. They're enjoying life and they figure we just carry on as though God does not exist because he's just like the absentee landlord. But then, when God gives some punishment in the world, then people start to wake up. They start coming into the masjid more. They start uh, practicing Islam more. So they think that now we should have a closer relationship with God because look at the suffering in the world. So in fact, the same suffering in the world might be a cause for some people to come towards Allah and reap eternal benefits in the life hereafter. So again, what appears to be a suffering might be there for good reasons. And as I say, we don't know all of the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, but so long as he has some good reasons for allowing suffering in the world, the one argument from atheism fails. What is the one argument? That there is suffering in the world and that proves that God does not exist. But it doesn't prove anything of the sort. Because God might be powerful, He might be loving, and He might be all-knowing, and yet He might allow suffering for some good reasons. See that? Moreover, we do not say that Allah is all-loving. This is a Christian statement to which atheism was born in reaction. But uh, we say that Allah loves some and Allah doesn't love some. In Allah la yuhib al kafirin, in Allah la yuhib al and so on and so forth. Allah does not like certain people. So there might be some uh, another argument there from a Muslim side which atheists have not really uh, been able to conquer, counter. So altogether then we have four reasons to prove that God exists. A fifth reason which we have thrown in there because this is your experience and we're saying the four plus the one altogether should make you confident on where you are. And unless somebody can give you some better reasons than these, after having knocking down these reasons for believing that God exists, there is no reason why you should just give up your belief for no reason at all. So now, atheists will come to you with questions like, well, if God is 
all, all powerful and so powerful as you say that he is well why don't you just come and show himself in the world well, let's look at that uh, surely Allah can do anything he's powerful we say but he may choose not to do certain things either because these things are below his dignity or because some things are just simply logically impossible so you don't demand of Allah to do something which is logically impossible alright let's, let's take some examples somebody says well why doesn't Allah come and show himself in the world and this is an old argument people have said this from way back the prophets came to them and they said well you know why are you speaking why doesn't Allah come himself and then the Jews said you know uh, ya Musa lan nu'mina laka hatta narallaha jahratan they said we're not going to believe in you Musa until we see Allah plainly you know he comes openly and we see him now remember what we said about the universe the universe is a physical entity right and we said that that physical entity had to be caused brought into existence by something which is not itself part of the physical universe true now that means that Allah if he does exist is not a part of the physical universe now parts of the finished physical universe can reorganize themselves atoms can be reorganized to make a human being and he comes live in front of you but now if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reorganizes some atoms in the universe to make a human being to come before you would that be Allah? no it wouldn't be Allah so even asking for Allah to come as a human being or to come in some form that we can see him is to ask Allah to be physical but Allah is not that so even that is asking something which makes no sense when you do analyze what really is being asked for now in the time of the Prophet ﷺ people ask you know let the sky fall on our heads then we will believe you see atheists sometimes don't think what they're asking for because if the sky really were to fall on their heads they would have no chance to believe after that they'd be dead <laughs> but you know they, they say you know this is what we want so altogether then I rest my case in saying that uh, there are good reasons for believing that Allah exists and that so, so long as there are these reasons we should continue to believe that and we should hold our heads high in the atheistic world we should realize that the challenges to being a Muslim is coming from that direction people are saying you know why should you uh, grow your beard why should you make salat why, why should you uh, give up dating before marriage uh, why, why should you you know do this or do that why do you want to live as a good Muslim? Why do you want to pattern your life according to all of these uh, laws and regulations? Why do you want to limit yourself like that? Why don't you just simply enjoy life? Why don't you try everything at least once? And whatever other slogans they have out there. But we say no, we live according to the law of God. And they say, well, you're depriving yourself. And we say no. Because uh, we realize that in fact, that at the end of the day, we are on sure ground and the only person who has to worry about the ground that he's on is the atheist did you realize that? a Muslim doesn't have to worry because uh, you know let, let's say that uh, let's say for argument's sake that Allah does not exist that uh, you know there's no soul there's no life after death there's no life in the grave there's no punishment in the life hereafter and so on so alright you just die and that's it you're, you're done your genes might survive in your offspring but you are just simply gone Alright, suppose you, you, you're a Muslim now and, you, and it turns out that you are, you are wrong in being a Muslim. So there's no life hereafter, there's no life after death. You don't lose anything because no matter what it looks like to the, from the outside, you're still enjoying your life. Even when you're fasting, somebody looks at you and figures you know, you're really having a hard time. But you, know, you are getting your own benefits out of that. Even if there are no spiritual benefits, you have some physical and material benefits. You know, you, you train your body you get rid of some excess fat that's really building up, up around, around your waistline uh, you um, at the same time you develop a mental fortitude what you decide you're able to do you have a control over your own decisions so you're not being led by your your wishes which sometimes can work against you in other words you have willpower which could help a lot of people if they had that people could give up drinking and gambling and smoking and all of these different uh, things if they could only help themselves but they say no I couldn't help myself uh, and we can go on and on about the physical benefits 
the the fact that you, you know something like fasting brings you together with the community. Human beings are social animals, and we need to socialize. If one is left alone, uh, his uh, mental and physical uh, development uh, and, and emotional development suffers. But you're in a community interacting with other individuals, and you just go stronger, bigger, greater. So you know there are so many physical and material benefits from just something like fasting. And at the end of the day, if I ask you, you say, yeah, I, I love to fast. People are looking forward for Ramadan to come. Just like somebody's eating hot chilies and he's sweating, his eyes watering and so on. You look at him, you say, this guy's having a hard time. But, you know, he loves to, to eat it, see? And uh, Muslims just love Ra Ramadan. So, we enjoy our lives anyhow. So, if it turns out that we were wrong and there is no Allah, there is no life hereafter and so on, we lose nothing. But if it turns out that we were right, we gain everything. Because we're talking about unlimited pleasures, you know, big houses, beautiful um, mansions, uh, is what you should really call them, made of rubies and flores of musk, and you have, you know, all of the pleasures that you want to enjoy in, in paradise. And that's forever. So it's, it's quite worth it. Now, if you, if you think of it as, as a gamble, you're betting your life on something, that is something to bet your life on, because you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Alright, you look at the other choice that we have, atheism. Now, what if the atheist turns out to be right? He gains nothing because he goes into non-existence. He dies and that's it, he's done. He gains nothing. Does he gain anything in the world? No, because his life does not have direction, he doesn't have sense, he doesn't have purpose. There's no meaning to his life. He just looks at the cosmos and he says, man, I'm nothing and for what? Right? I mean, you look around and you say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm compared to my creator. I am nothing, but in relation with my Creator, I am something special. But for the atheist, he cannot be something special. He's just simply nothing. He's just, uh, you know, part of a, a very cruel, all of the cruelty that talked about in the world, they're part of that cruel universe which coughed them up some 15 billion years ago and will eventually swallow them back up into a big crunch. And life has no meaning. <laughs> There's no purpose. There's no reason even for living. So suicide is a good option. <laughs> and now you understand why mercy killing gets a good rap because you know th th there's nothing um, here to live for so if you're enjoying life yeah that's okay and uh, you know if you can kill yourself and feel happy doing it then that's your one last kick in life <laughs> as you kick the bucket so the atheist really has nothing really to gain even if he is right either to gain in the life hereafter or because to him there's no life hereafter or to gain in this world because his life lacks sense, purpose, direction and meaning. If on the other hand he's wrong then he's up the creek without a paddle. Right? He's lost forever. Like, you know, a, an astronaut who gets dislodged from his spaceship and he just floats about endlessly in the dark reaches of outer space with no end. So then, we think about it carefully and we see that the only person who can benefit is the believer. And the only one who stands to lose is the non-believer. So it makes better sense to bet your life on unbelief. So say to your atheist friends, you know, if, uh, if I'm right, we'll soon find out. And if you're right, we'll never find out. <laughs> So I'll take your questions. I'm sure you have lots of questions in your mind. Challenges that people put before you because you, of your faith, the faith that you believe in. The requests that they put before you to be like them. Yes? Uh, There's a question that a non-Muslim brother asked me. If Allah is so powerful, then why did He create man in the first place? Or angels? And why does He want us to worship Him and serve Him? <laughs> what is the purpose behind it? He doesn't understand the logic. You are the Muslim from his family background, but not, not anymore. Okay. Now, the question is, if, if Allah is so powerful, why did He create angels and why did He create human beings to worship Him? Why should He even need such, uh, such worshippers? Well, to answer this question, we have to get into the mind of the Creator. And we have to know all about the motives, the aspirations of the Creator. And we have to say, all right, we know that if such a creator exists, such a creator will never create uh, things like human beings or like angels to worship him. But in fact, nobody is in a position to know that. 
So as an argument, it just fails because it has no basis. You know, an argument has to have a base. It has to start with some observation and know something for a fact and then says, okay, uh, we know this for a fact and what you're telling me contradicts the fact, therefore what you're telling me should be wrong. But what they're starting from is, is nothing. He doesn't even know how the Creator should respond in a certain situation. So there is no basis for that argument and the argument does not need an answer. He has to have some basis first. However, saying that the argument needs no answer doesn't mean that we are totally devoid of having answers. Uh, we know from within Islam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created uh, human beings and, uh, and jinn to worship him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might have created angels for the same purpose. But that worship that we perform to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although it is said, you know, this is your purpose, that is not beneficial to Allah but it is beneficial to human beings. And it is, uh, in fact, a necessary part of our growth and development to, to worship Allah. Just like we need physical food, we also need spiritual food. But we look at it from a broader perspective than just simply bowing our heads before Allah. The very consciousness that we have of Allah. You know, Islam has a very broad understanding of worship. Our conscious appreciation of Allah is also part of that worship, thinking, reflecting, and so on. Now, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not created conscious human beings, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not be known. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to express His love to conscious human beings, then the only way to create such conscious human beings is to create things like us whose purpose would be to worship Him. So if the Creator is loving, and He wants to express love, then this is the way to do it. So it makes perfect sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would create beings like us, whose purpose is to worship Him, if worship is understood in that uh, broader, more general sense of uh, being in conscious appreciation of Allah's beauty and wisdom and glory and might. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. If someone were to come to you and, uh, you know, uh, and maybe the Bogans argue with uh, that, uh, that, you know, uh, when you fear Allah, or they say when you these material, secular material, and they say when you fear Allah, it's uh, because of your uh, fluctuations in your uh, cortisol levels or neuro neurological impulses and, and whatnot, whatever they tell you. Uh, and then, you know, if you're worshiping Allah, and you feel uh, faith or Iman, uh, you know, they say that they can just say full humanity, inshallah, right? Then they'll, they'll, they'll tell you what we're talking about. I was wondering how, and how you would uh, go about uh, you know, dealing with someone with that argument. Mm -hmm. Okay, well the question is, um, you know, somebody may say that when you fear Allah, that can be explained by the, you know, change, chemical changes in your body, cortisone levels and so on. And in a similar sense, when you feel imbued with faith, that can also be explained by chemical changes in your body. Um, how do we respond to that? Well, in response we can say that explaining how something works uh, does not um, by itself explain why the thing works that way. Now you can explain, okay, what, are the chem what is the relationship between the chemicals in your body and, and the, uh, the um, consciousness that you have? But why do you have that consciousness in the first place? Why does your body produce this and not something else? Why do you have something like faith? So that needs a bigger explanation than what the chemicals can provide. And the bigger explanation is offered only within religion. It's not offered within atheism. Atheism has no answer for that. So atheists can only explain the how of things. There are, for example, you can use uh, arguments from within bio biology to explain how a human being comes into existence. But they cannot explain why we are here in the first place. They can study physics and uh, astronomy and explain, you know, the, the details of the evolution of the universe over its 15 billion year history and even project uh, for its um, future. But uh, they cannot explain why the universe is here in the first place. Why do we have something here? And what is its purpose? Why should it exist? Why should we exist at all? So none of that can be explained. So explain how, explaining how a thing works does not explain why a thing works. Let me give an analogy, because sometimes, you know, these are philosophical arguments that seem to be up in the air somewhere, and it doesn't really register well in the mind. 
Okay, think of a television set. Somebody can go into all the details explaining how this set works, you know, what is the, diff what is the relationship between, you know, the picture on, on, uh, appearing on the screen and the, and the changes in the electrodes, you know, throughout the system and so on. But that does not tell you why television was invented in the first place. Why did somebody even bother to make something like a television set? And, and why should it show pictures as opposed to something else? Why do we have it working in this way? That is not explained by electronics. That might uh, belong to some other science. It might be uh, belong more to history. Or maybe the history of science or something. But not necessarily to electronics itself, you see. So the explanation of how things happen with our, within our bodies is not a, a sufficient explanation for the very fact that we do have that result. We do have faith or we do have the fear of Allah and so on. But let's take it a step further. You didn't ask this specifically, but I can see it leading here. Somebody may say, well, you guys just have fear of God because of the way you were brought up. Or you just believe in God because of the way you were brought up. But your answer can very well be that they are saying that you believe that because of the way you were brought up, because of the way they were brought up. In other words, they are saying what they are saying because of the way they were brought up. They were brought up to think that anyone who says he has faith is saying that because of the way he was brought up. <laughs> so, now, what your answer here is showing is that when they come to you with this, they commit what is called a genetic fallacy. Genetic fallacy in argument is to put such an argument which tries to explain a thing by where it came from. So, your parents told you to believe this, and you believe it, they're saying therefore that's wrong. But no, it might be the truth even though your parents told you. Or even though some idiot on the street told you, it might still be true. Right? So whether it's true or false, it doesn't matter where it came from or who told you that. You have to look at reasons for believing it or reasons for not believing it. And we've already seen that there are good reasons for believing that God exists, and there are no good reasons for believing that God does not exist. So whether it's your parents or your imam or whoever told you to believe this, that doesn't prove that it is true or false, logically. And so they're bringing that to you as a reason why you shouldn't believe. It just shows the bankruptcy of the whole enterprise of atheism. They don't have good arguments. Somebody else had another. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I, like, I, I'm talking about elders keep telling me that God knows everything, God knows what's going to happen in the future. Really, I have to accept that too. Okay. The question is, we always hear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything and knows what's going to happen in the future, but we also hear that we can change what is going to happen in the future, and is that true? Now the answer is that from our limited perspective, this is a, a, a very difficult point for anyone to understand. And I'd just like to explain where the problem comes from. Once you believe that God knows what is going to happen in the future, that means if I'm going to kill somebody tomorrow, God already knows it. And if God knows it now already, then I'll have to do the same thing. Otherwise, God's knowledge would have been wrong. See? So, this is the conundrum that um, people from Judea, within Judaism, Christianity and Islam have wrestled with. And there's no answer that is completely satisfying to the to the intellect for this, because we are looking at it from a limited perspective. Um, perhaps uh, Einstein's uh, discovery of relativity might give us some insight into this, into this question. It's all a matter of perspective. You see, when you are within the, the cosmos, you are within time. Scientists like St um, Stephen Hawking and others speak about the, the the, the Big Bang origin of the universe some 15 billion years ago and they say that at that time not only space but also time came into existence. So they talk about the explosion of, of the space-time continuum in four dimensions. Three dimensions for space, one dimension for time. Now again, this too is hard for us to imagine what is meant by all of this. But just think now that we are part of time then. And since God exists outside of the universe, God is not subject to the same time that we are subject to. So he's outside of time. We are within time. 
So God's perspective and our perspective are two entirely different perspectives now. So from where we are, time is flowing in one direction. The arrow of time moves only one way. And it is not reversed. But now from Allah's perspective, you know, given again, I'll be looking at it from this reasonable perspective of, uh, you know, harmonizing with relativity theory now. From Allah's perspective then, all of time is just simply one. For us, there is a past, there is a present, and there is a future. But if one is not within the same time frame, if one is not in part of our space-time continuum, then he is not subjected to that time. And to him, past, present, and future is all the same. Now that's from relativity. One who is not within the time-space continuum would not have the same experience of time. So then if, if we now take advantage of that, we would say that Allah being outside of our space-time continuum sees everything as though it has already happened. It's all the same to Him, whether it's past, present, or future. So now we start to understand why you know some things I mentioned in the Quran about the future but is given in the past tense as though it has already happened, as though the judgment has already been set up, and people are already being judged. Some people are already in paradise, some people are already in hell. So for Allah, it's all the same, it's already done. But now, within that, um, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is going to happen in the future, and He has determined certain things, He has given us hope. And we cannot deny that either. We know that we have volition to do what we decide to do. Now, if we, for one moment, thought that human beings do not have volition, and that everything is controlled and predetermined, then that would mean that we would not be able to set up any kind of system of law that gives rewards and punishments. Because, forget about Islam for a moment. Think about your secular world. If you want to set up a system of rewards, that means you are saying that somebody has done something good, like he decided to do something good and he deserves a reward for it. Like you don't go rewarding a post because the post might be doing something good, holding up your roof, but you don't go say, mashallah, good post. <laughs> because it does not have volition. It is just there where you placed it, right? Now if we thought that human beings were like that, then there is no reason for rewarding them. And worse, there is no reason for punishing them. You couldn't punish any criminal for anything because if you think that human beings do not have volition, then this poor guy was not responsible for what he has done. So you shouldn't punish him. But we do acknowledge that people do have volition, they do have will, they decide to do certain things and then they act accordingly. And because of knowing that they do have that volition, then we set up a system of reward and punishment in our secular laws. So then in conclusion, we have two things which seem to be in dichotomy with each other. We have the knowledge of Allah and His power, and we have, on the other hand, the fact of our human position. We have to affirm both. That we do have scope to act and to change things, but at the same time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in ultimate control. How to reconcile the two has been a continuous problem for people of faith whether in Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. But uh, modern studies in the area of relativity theory now gives us a, a, a way of bridging this and to understand it so that it does not become so much of a conundrum. Allah being outside of our space-time continuum does not have the same limitations as we have. We see things as being in the past and things as being in the future. But to Allah, the past and the future, the present, all are the same. All right, question. It is always said that weaker people who have no power needed to believe in God and religion. The powerful and wealthy people who really does not need God don't need to believe in Him. Please comment. Well, again, this um, question again, reveals the genetic fallacy. Some atheist says to you, Oh, it is only the poor people needed to believe in God because they needed to depend on something. But even if they believe in God because of that need, that doesn't prove that God does not exist, does it? That doesn't prove that the belief itself is false. Somebody might have believed something for the wrong reason, and that belief might still be true. Alright? Now, you know, if I say, 
you know, today is Monday, and it rains every Monday, so I conclude that it must be raining right now. Now, it might still be raining right now, even though it is not Monday, and even though it doesn't always rain on Monday. I might be wrong about what day of week it is, I might be superstitious about how often it rains, and yet it might still be raining cats and dogs outside. So saying that somebody has believed something for the wrong reason does not prove the belief to be false. And the most the atheist can come to you and say is, oh, you guys just believe that because you need to depend on some higher being. Or you just believe that because of your evolutionary history. Or you just believe that because of your social conditioning. Or you just believe that because you were born in Pakistan. Or whatever. But that has nothing to do with whether the belief is true or whether it is false. It might still be true, and we have already shown that there are good reasons for believing that that belief is true. So we rest our case on that. Uh, question, I've been asked if God created us, who created God? Now, although that is commonly put as a conundrum to thwart believers and to make them confused, it, you shouldn't be confused if you think about it carefully. Remember our argument now, um, that at first we found so difficult to fathom, but then we took it apart and we looked at it more closely, we looked at the series of dominoes and so on. And we said that, all right, here you have the series of dominoes, one knocking down the other, one knocking down the other. There has to be a first one. So now, if we ask about the first one, what is its function? It knocked down the second one, right? If we ask who knocked down the second one, we say the first one did it. Right? Now, if we ask who knocked down the first one, our answer is it is not a domino that knocked down the first domino. So now, if you ask, well, who knocked down the first thing that was not a domino? You're asking a question here about something that nobody knows about. So far, right, in our analysis. We, we know about the dominoes because we've analyzed that to the first one. And we know that the first one could not have fallen unless that was also knocked down. And we know that it was not knocked down by a domino. So now to ask who knocked down that first one, we don't even know that that first one was knocked down. He might have just went flipped like this and knock down the first one. So you cannot ask the same question about the cause of the whole series that you can ask about the series itself. So when we said that the universe is a series of physical states, and the first physical state must have been caused by another state which is not itself a physical state, then you cannot ask about that non-physical state the same questions that you asked about the physical states. You can measure temperatures of the physical states, you can measure density and so on, but you're not supposed to be able to measure the same thing about something which is non-physical. You can ask who created the physical world. But you're not supposed to ask the same question about who created the non-physical world because you don't know anything about that. You don't know anything about causation, about uh, physics just doesn't apply to the non-physical world. So you don't ask the same questions. But now let's lo look at it from another logical perspective. We describe God as the first cause. As the uncreated creator of everything else. So now, it, when, we, when we describe him as the uncreated creator, it is now wrong to now ask, well, who created the uncreated being? Because if he's uncreated, that means by definition that he's not created. And he has no creator. <laughs> not by definition. But the thing is not just simply true by definition, it's true by logical implication. If we need this... Um, we, we think of existence as one after another, like God now, just don't think of just the physical universe, just think of anything that could possibly exist, and God is now the first cause of all of those things. So now if God is the first cause, then we can explain the second cause by saying the first cause brought us into existence. But you cannot now ask, well, who brought the first cause into existence, because in that case he would not be the first cause. So to ask, well, you know, who came before the first? Like, you know, you have a race, let's say. You say, okay, somebody came in third. You ask, who came in before him? The guy who came in second. You ask, who came before him? The guy who came in first. You ask, who came before him? You're asking nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the best that atheists can come up with. They can ask, who came before the first cause? Or who created the uncreated creator? And so on. In the end, we should be satisfied. We should be thankful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us to faith is the faith that we know to be true. And uh, after all the philosophical arguments are done, 
we return to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we read that, you have no doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to you. So Islam is more than just simply logical arguments. It is that, exp- it, it, that experience that you have of the living presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life. And uh, the logical argument is uh, to you just the further confirmation that what you have always known is actually true. And uh, you should not give that up for just no reason at all, or just for these uh, silly arguments that are brought from the atheistic direction. Wa khirdawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.